glad to be back. You know, I've been sick and my whole household has been sick. Um, so I'm glad that I can finally get back into the rotation. Yeah, definitely. I know there's been some just really yucky stuff going around, um, you know, yes. stomach and flu and all of that. So yeah, we're glad to have you back. Um, so tonight what I want to do with you guys is uh, we're going to look at and talk about a few things um, in Moodle just to make sure everybody's, you know, feeling okay about everything. Let me just, um, and uh, you know, I'll walk you through some assignments and that kind of stuff. So, like I said, you guys, you know, feel pretty confident about what you're doing moving forward. And then um, I'll go through the presentation. And of course, you know, any questions or concerns or anything like that you have, just stop me. And, um, you know, we'll, we'll talk about it. So let me pull this up. I'm going to share my screen so y'all can see what I'm looking at. Dr. Johnson, I do have a question before you start. Sure. Um, sure. The data that I'm using is from the Louisiana Department of Education. Mm -hmm. um, and recently there was a hack yes, in their system. So yeah. I'm not able to go back in. Is that okay? Or is there anything else that I would need? Um, no, if you, if you downloaded or pulled what you needed to complete an assignment, you should be fine. Um, okay. If you didn't, um, you know, we're monitoring that situation as well because thankfully it didn't hit the universities, but um, hopefully everything should be kind of back to normal soon. But yeah, if you pulled it, uh, you should be fine. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Okay. All right. Thank you. You're quite welcome. Okay. So hopefully you guys can see my screen. Um, so we are actually um, not in week three, <laughs> we're in week four. There we go. Um, but I'm going to look back at. at um, uh, week three. So as you know, you have this case study that's going to be due. Um, it is going to use the data. Um, this is, I'm pulling up week two right now. So hopefully you were able to complete, sorry, my computer sometimes can be a little bit slow, especially when I need it to not be. <laughs> I'm going to actually stop sharing for a second. Okay, where'd you guys go? There you are. Okay, so let me share again so you can actually see what I'm looking at. So um, this is the template. Um, and so like, you know, Kirsten, when we were just talking about, if you've already filled this out, then you're, you're good. Um, it's worth 20 points, but it counts towards the overall score on the case study. Um, a lot of districts and states have not published their 2019 data. Um, some of them have even have not even published 2018. So for example, I was looking today at some data um, for a school in Louisiana and the most recent the data they had was from, they had three years, they had 2015, 2016, and 2017. If that's true for you or your school, just change these years um, so I know what year you're talking about, okay? Now, ideally, we want you to use the most current three years because yeah, at the end of the day, I want this to be helpful to you um, and something you can actually use in your school or classes. Um, but, you know, like I said, if the data is not available, just, you know, if you only have two years of data, that's fine. Um, don't let this hang you up, okay? So let me see if I can figure out how to stop sharing this part. There we go. All right, so now let me switch back over here to show you in Moodle what I'm talking about. Okay, so that was um, from week two. Then in week three, you will notice this is where I assigned your case study. It's not due until this coming Sunday. Um, you know, so just, to, you know, hopefully everybody can get that turned in. Um, here are the directions, maybe. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Sometimes my computer just doesn't behave like I wanted to. Let me share this with you guys again. Okay, so here is the, um, the assignment. You have two options. You can do either a PowerPoint presentation and a graphic organizer, or you can actually do the template 
um, that's provided and also a graphic organizer. So uh, if you do the PowerPoint, it's gonna be um, 15 to 20 slides using your data that we just talked about. Um, if you choose to use the template, that's fine too. In both cases, you're gonna use a graphic organizer. It can be any graphic organizer you want to. Um, you know, there's not, there's not one that I'm asking you to do. It can be a Venn diagram, it can be a bubble map, uh, you know, whatever. Um, and what you're gonna do with that particular graphic organizer is you're going to just summarize the most critical piece pieces um, from your assignment. So it may be that, um, you know, you're gonna look at the data and you're gonna look at the interventions and stuff like that. So let me show you, um, let's see, here's the template. Again, let me come back over here and stop sharing. There, stop share. Let me share again. Okay, so this is the actual template. Uh, you know, and basically you're going to go through and there's some weird typo glitches in here that numbers are, you know, like here it says strategic budge blank NG. I don't know what was going on with this when I uploaded it. So I apologize, but hopefully those are pretty minor. Um, but you're going to go through and fill this out. Now keep in mind, like I said last week um, in the video, that you don't have to do all these bullets. Uh, you know, just do at least three. That's kind of my rule of thumb. Um, and again, you don't have to fill, you know, you, I'm not asking you to write a book. Um, just give me the highlights. So for example, um, you know, maybe in my graphic organizer, I wanna focus on the student achievement needs. Um, so I'm gonna do a flow chart on how we're gonna address student needs. So it may start with, we're gonna do, uh, you know, our needs assessment, it's the first box in my flow chart. Um, you know, then I'm gonna put in there what my, um, some of my data is, might be the second step that I may put in there, my personnel and staff needs. You can just kind of follow this template to create that graphic organizer, okay? But like I said, if that organizer is really for you as much as anything, so um, you're welcome to do whatever makes sense to you. Okay, so let me again, hang on one sec. Okay, so does that kind of make sense? You guys feeling okay about that? Yes. Okay, I thanks. <laughs> yeah, I figured if you guys were having problems, somebody would be hollering at me by now. So um, let's go ahead and look at week four, which is actually the week we're in. Um, and again, let me switch over so y'all can see that instead of me. Um, so this time, um, there was some questions about, um, do we have a discussion forum, do we not, whatever. No, you don't. Um, the only thing that you have, well, there's several things, but you have a reflection question um, for this week. Uh, you, I went ahead and opened up and gave you the midterm exam, but it's not due until December 1st. Um, but I know some people like to work over Thanksgiving because they have a few days off, so it's really up to you. Um, and um, like I said, just moving forward, but let me pull up real quick the midterm in case you guys have any questions since we won't be talking next week. Um, this is really pretty simple. <laughs> so again, you can either do a graphic organizer a page, a picture, or a video um, as long as you answer these five questions. Um, and I don't think they're very hard. <laughs> so I've learned the following about urban schools and systems. Um, these are the questions I still have. Um, honestly, this should not be more than one page, okay? Because um, again, it's really about me getting some feedback from you guys. So if you choose to do a picture or a graphic organizer or you know a one-page summary, that's fine. Uh, but please don't do more than one page. Um, you also, if you do a video clip, which is fine too, I've had students do that in the past. Um, depending on the size of your video, you may or may not be able to actually put it in Moodle. Um, you may have to um, uh, send it to me like Google Docs or maybe even email, if that makes sense, um, because sometimes it just doesn't work. Um, but sometimes it does too, so, okay? All right, so let's look at what we're actually gonna talk about tonight. So again, let me do my sharing. Here we go, maybe, there it goes. Okay, so what I wanna talk to you guys about tonight is, 
what I call the invisible student. Um, you know, one of the things that when I started really kind of thinking about urban schools and urban school reform, um, and you know, I was pretty, I was very passionate about getting this program started here at LSUS because we know that the population in our country is really moving more and more towards urban centers. Our rural population is decreasing. Um, many of our traditional suburbs are now um, becoming more urban in terms of the population and stuff that they serve. Um, so, you know, it's really important that we, we truly stop and take a moment to think about what are those unique or special characteristics of urban youth. So that's where this is coming from. Um, and that's really sort of the basis and foundation for the work that we're doing. Hang on, sorry, I was trying to grab my notes. Give me one second. Uh, sorry guys, it's been one of those days. I have literally been nonstop. So let's think for just a minute about what is the best model. Uh, you know, depending on who you talk to and what school of thought they're coming from, there's a ton of debate about it. But I will tell you, I don't think there is a single model that really works. I think every urban school or every urban school system is so uniquely different um, from each other that there's not a model or a one size fits all that's really gonna work. It comes down to, um, and certainly the research bears this out, that we have to understand the needs of our students in our community. We have to have the most highly qualified and best trained teachers we can possibly get into our schools. And from there, we can, I hate to use the word bastardize, but that's probably the best, um, the best term. We can pull the best elements from different models and design a program that is going to meet the needs of our students. So let's talk first about what is unique um, and special about our students that are sitting in our schools today. So, we really have to think about the characteristics. Now, some of this is, um, you know, sort of the conglomerate average. This is not necessarily true for every student in schools, uh, but the research bears out that there are certain um, characteristics that seem to follow our students through our urban schools. And this is true regardless of their race or ethnicity. Um, the one common denominator that we see in our, in our urban schools is generally going to be um, low socioeconomic status. Not always, but for the most part, that's going to be the case. So, you know, I, I took a lot of this information from, um, you know, the book, uh, uh, that we've been taught, you know, that for white people, well, I cannot speak tonight, guys, I'm so sorry. For white folks who teach in the hood and the rest of y'all too, um, Dr. Um, Emden really talks a lot about uh, the distorted viewpoint that urban students have about themselves and unfortunately that many teachers have about them as well. So he describes urban youth as, as students who oftentimes have a um, distorted self-image, um, you know, that they see themselves as broken or teachers will see them as broken or dirty. Um, you know, a lot of teachers go into our urban schools or our leaders as well and believe that they need to be the savior um, of our youth, which is really not what we should be doing. Um, the day-to-day -day just existence can be a challenge for our students. Uh, you know, I know I, there always seem to be lots of kids every day that, you know, came to school, they hadn't had breakfast, they had inadequate clothing, you know, they didn't have coats, they didn't have school materials, all of those kind of things, because these kids were literally just trying to survive. They live with real fear, um, you know, so even here in Shreveport, Bossier, uh, you know, it seems like every single day there's one or more shootings in our neighborhoods uh, here in, in Shreveport. Um, you know, so the living with real fear about whether or not you're going to live or die um, is very palatable for, or, you know, and, and pretty impactful um, to our children. Um, as a result of that very real fear that's founded in the fact that, you know, uh, gunfire seems to be the norm. Um, it creates anxiety and fear for our students. And unfortunately, these students also are very frequently over-disciplined and penalized 
um, by just about any system or organization you can think of, whether it's the schools, the police, the court systems, et cetera. So, you know, this is not, I'm not telling you this to feel sorry for the kids, but to really begin to understand their reality. Um, and so that we're not seeing um, the world through our eyes, but to begin to really be that empathetic listener and person who can understand what it is our students are going through. We also know that when we've tried to reform things uh, in particular our schools, that they tend to fail because of um, multiple factors. So for example, oftentimes educators who are well-meaning will go into a school to quote, reform it or transform it. That's kind of the new buzzword. Um, but they, they ignore class distinctions. Most teachers who go to teach in an urban school don't live in the neighborhood, don't live in the community. They're from a different socioeconomic background. Um, and so they, tend, they think it's okay to ignore those class distinctions. But in reality, those distinctions exist. And so we have to, to really embrace them and then begin to understand and, and deal with those in a very systemic and thoughtful way. We also um, see a lot of times that people who work in our urban schools tend to underestimate their distance from the community. Now, what I mean by that is not necessarily, you know, in miles, but what I'm talking about is the fact that when you don't live in the community, you're not, you have, don't have similar day-to-day -day experiences, it creates a distance between not only the teacher or the, the campus uh, staff, um, you know, it creates distance from the students, but it also also creates distance for everyone else in that community too. Um, we also fail to really stop and think about it and understand the day-to-day -day lives of our children. Um, you know, I think back on my background, you know, and, and I didn't come from a rich family, uh, you know, uh, we were probably lower middle class at, at best, um, but I never knew what it was like to go hungry. Uh, you know, I think, thankfully in my life, I've never had that experience, but I have worked with students my whole life um, who knew that is a very real possibility. The only meal they might get during that, you know, that day is going to be the free lunch we gave them. Um, so, you know, again, that, that's just a very different mindset than many of us can even imagine. We also fail to really understand what those experiences um, our students and their families have had in schools. And so they have a very strong perceived understanding of uh, schools and systems and, and people who work in them. Um, and a lot of times I don't think we really stop and think about what that is. We also see that there is a context that dismisses our students' lives and experiences, like that's your life out there, you're here in school, we're, we're going to ask you to behave the same way um, that we would expect a student who comes from an affluent or for a highly, from a highly educated family. When in reality, those students, you know, this is kind of like walking into a foreign country. Uh, you know, and so we have to teach our students what school culture is and how um, to, to successfully navigate that. Um, and then we also use a lot of buzzwords. Um, and again, that's not in the vernacular of our parents or community or our students. And so it's again creates another separation. So we have lots of people who go into our urban schools and they, you know, they want to do the right thing. They have great intentions. Uh, you know, these are good people, but unfortunately their best intentions can oftentimes lead to um, those unintended consequences. So what I mean by that is that basically you have people who fall into separate groups. So first you have um, our students who look at themselves and live in that survivor sort of mode. Um, and the whole idea for them is that they need to protect themselves and, and really at any cost, uh, you know, they don't have a lot of advocates in their lives uh, in many cases. And, um, you know, and even uh, their parents uh, will often respond that way. They do anything they can to avoid being ridiculed. Um, so, you know, if a student um, misbehaves in class and the teacher calls them out, um, the, the student will respond so that they don't feel ridiculed or made fun of. Um, and as a result of that, it's oftentimes seen as misbehavior when in reality, um, the student's just trying to save face. Um, many times, too, they don't know how to successfully channel their emotions um, because, again, they've not been taught 
taught those skills that um, students from you know other backgrounds uh, have learned. Um, overall, they have low self-esteem. Um, they will show symptoms of trauma. Um, they'll be very angry. Um, they are fearful, as we talked about a minute ago, but they show it through bravado. Um, so, you know, I, I can literally think of dozens of students that I've worked with who, um, you know, were, were absolutely almost the archetype for that, that they had fear, but they showed bravado in the face, you know, as opposed to uh, showing their vulnerability. Then from the teacher perspective, teachers oftentimes um, see themselves either consciously or subconsciously as the savior, and so they'll feel sorry for the student. They will unintentionally discredit the student, um, you know, and again, it, they think that it's discipline or that it's helping the child when in reality, um, it is not. It's having the opposite effect. Um, because many times, too, our teachers and leaders in schools are not really equipped um, to deal with students in some of these very difficult emotions. Um, so they will resort to either ignoring them or trying to work around them. They have that healer mentality, but they also buy into the stereotypes. Um, so again, instead of seeing their students as individuals, they see them as what they think, uh, you know, represents an urban student. Um, they do try to be very generous, um, and, and that's a great attribute to bring to the table, but at the same time, um, that generosity is not always directed to where the real need is. Um, and they think that they're here to be heroes. Uh, and don't get me wrong, people who work in urban environments deserve tons of kudos and praise uh, because it is the most challenging but also the most rewarding work um, that you can ever do. So, how do we know if a teacher is going to be successful? Um, and this is true for leaders and other staff members as well. So, you know, the first part of that is they truly have to be in touch. So as many opportunities as they can get to be in the community with their students, the better. So I know one thing, when I was a high school principal, it was an urban high school, um, one of our interview questions were, how important is it that you attend games, um, concerts, you know, after school events? Uh, and what we were looking for were teachers who absolutely understood this was a priority because our students needed to see us there supporting them, uh, whether it was in a church choir concert um, or on the football field. Uh, you know, you have to show that you're physically willing to step out into the community and support your children. You also have to understand the dynamics of the community. So I know one of the things that, you know, my leadership team did um, was we met with the various pastors. We went out and met people who owned the small businesses. Um, you know, we canvassed the neighborhoods and we would talk to apartment managers and, you know, pretty much everybody and uh, did home visits. Um, you know, to our students and their families um, because we wanted them to know that we cared about them on a very real level, but most importantly, we had to understand their community um, and, you know, uh, to, to gain their trust and to gain their, their, to gain their acceptance. You also have to understand the role that physical places play. So, you know, depending on the population of students or the group of students that you are serving, um, you know, home can mean different things. Uh, so, for example, uh, or family, uh, you know, when you're working with urban students who are um, Hispanic or Latino, family is like the most important driver um, for them. So, you know, we, we had to engage oftentimes, even though technically, you know, we shouldn't be talking to the aunt or the uncle or the grandmother or the grandfather or whatever. These were critical people in our students' lives. So, you know, you, you kind of move beyond um, what the rules tell you uh, and, and just work with anybody who's willing to be there and help their child. Also with urban students, you're not, you have to be invited in to their emotional, um, you know, place or their feelings, uh, you know, and so you'll know when that moment happens and that's when you really can get a breakthrough with your, with the student. We also have to know that they feel alienated from what we think is just the norm of a school. So for example, um, it's kind of like I remember when I was teaching um, developmentally delayed children who were like ages three to five. Uh, and, you know, I'm asking them to get in a line and, you know, I might as well have been talking, 
I don't know, Greek to them. They didn't have a clue. So we had to teach that. We had to practice it. Um, in fact, uh, you know, kind of the best analogy is, it's like if I go to Turkey, you're going to have to teach me how to behave in Turkey because the culture is vastly different than what I'm used to. For our urban students, we oftentimes have to teach them what is school culture and what the norms are at school. You don't discount the behavior in the community, but you teach them how you want them to behave in school. So, um, you know, when I was a middle school principal, we were in the highest crime area in the city of Dallas. That's where my school and community was located. We had 35 identified gangs in the school, had gang houses literally across the street um, from the school. Um, we had multiple drive-by shootings that happened. In fact, the front of the school had multiple bullet holes in it. Um, and so, you know, we have this very clear agreement we spent the first couple of days of school teaching our students what was expected and we teach them practice it teach and practice it reinforce support reinforce support but i would tell them look i know that you have to be different out in your community you know whether you're walking to and from school in the neighborhood whatever i understand that and i respect that so here's the deal when you're in our school no gang stuff none of this but when you're out in the community I know you have to do what you need to do to survive. And so we tried to really equip our students with a dual set of competencies um, because it was really, really important. The other thing that we have to do is know that our students, for them, imagination. They have these, our students have rich imaginations. Um, and they oftentimes, particularly during stress, will use that as a means of escape. Um, they know very well um, that they have three options at any time. They can fight, they can flee, or they can freeze. So for example, when the gunshots start ringing out in the apartment complex, they can either go out and fight and engage in it, they can run away from it, um, you know, by leaving the premises, uh, that's not always possible, or they can freeze. So, you know, hit the ground, that's a standard response. Because of that, they feel really powerless. And as a world, we tell them race doesn't matter, but they know differently. They know that they're going to be treated differently than students from another place. Um, I will never forget, um, it, it probably was not my best shining moment um, as a principal, but we were so excited. It was the first year our football team had made the playoffs. And we had worked really hard. We had brought in some great coaches. And, you know, Texas football's king. But, you know, we also were making huge strides academically. But, um, you know, we had the mindset every student, every single student needs to be involved in something extracurricular. So I, we, we were fortunate to pull together this incredible coaching staff who understood urban kids. And like I said, we were so excited. We were going to the, our first playoff game. We were going to get to play at Texas Stadium. You know, my kids lived in Irving, Texas, but none of them had ever been to Texas Stadium. Um, so they were super excited. And we happened to be playing a very well-known team that was from a very, very affluent um, community. And we're pulling in on the buses and we've got, you know, kids and we did a caravan and we even had buses for our parents, for the rest of our students so they could come. And like I said, it was really exciting. And as we began to walk into Texas Stadium, when we look up in the stands and we see these huge, huge signs that say, cash beats trash. I was livid. And I went and found the principal of that school and shared with him my absolute displeasure. And his response to me was, why do you care? Your kids are not going to ever amount to be anything. My kids are going to be the next CEOs. Needless to say, um, a certain side of me came out that probably shouldn't, um, you know, uh, in terms of professionalism. But that's exactly what our kids faced all the time. And it not only broke my heart, it made me furious. Um, so we don't really, you know, we may say these things don't matter, socioeconomic status, you can overcome it. But in reality, we can't control what else happens to our kids. Um, they also um, really can be the victim, I hate to use the word victims because I think that's kind of a negative word, but they experience physical and symbolic violence on a pretty regular basis that most of us can't even imagine. So we have to do better. 
and how do we do better? You know, these are kind of the 10 golden rules, I guess, for helping our urban youth to be successful. So we need new approaches. Um, we have to embrace this com complex world in which our students live. And we also have to have a real vision. So what does success look like? Um, we also have to understand and see students the same way they see themselves so that we can help them to be built up. Um, we have to accept and know um, that they have loss, they have pain, they've experienced injustice. And as much as that may break our hearts, um, you know, it is the reality our kids live in. And so again, we have to help them be resilient, help them to find coping mechanisms. Um, you know, what power brokers see in our students um, is very distorted. Uh, so whether it's, you know, um, the first job interview they go on or et cetera, we have to celebrate students and their stories. They, the realities they face, they're very complex. Um, but we also have to make sure to our own biases, and we all have them. You know, no matter how hard we try to overcome them, whether it's a, a bias about race, class, power, beliefs, values, or even our own pre presuppositions. Um, and we also have to understand that reality for our students is based on facts um, and even the unwritten rules. Um, you know, and I put principles, P-A-L-S, it should be principles, L-E-S, um, that they have formed just through the nature of being. Um, so I know as a high school principal, that was a really hard one for, you know, my school staff and I to kind of overcome um, because a lot of what had happened to our kids had built up from those early childhood years all the way through middle school. And by the time they got to high school, um, you know, they didn't think that they could trust us. I certainly couldn't trust the principal. You certainly couldn't trust the vice principal. So we had to work super hard um, to show them that we could rewrite the script basically. So what do educators need to be successful? Got to have a different lens. You've got to know that vocabulary. Um, you have to embrace our students who are new in our school culture as well as those that maybe um, it's kind of the difference I guess here in between students who go through a regular high school or go through one of the magnet programs. They may both be living in the same community but you have some students because of the magnet schools who probably are much better equipped to understand and follow school culture than may and again not always true um, than students who maybe have not had that kind of experience. Um, we also have to know that, you know, while we see physical wins, and, and sadly I've seen way too much of that from, uh, from my kids, um, we also have to understand that their souls can be wounded. Um, and that, you know, soul wounds oftentimes are bigger um, than anything we see physically or even um, the issues that come to the forefront. Um, so it's imperative that we have that really great environment that respects our students, our culture, their unique, wonderful abilities, their differences, and all of those kind of things. So um, Dr. Edmund, um, talks as well, um, I'm sorry, Emden, I always say it backwards, um, also talks about how to have what he calls the reality pedagogy, um, that understanding about the environment, and we've talked about this, um, that instead of the teacher, you know, being the sage on the stage, um, that our students know. They can tell us how they best learn. And for us, it's really just about making sure the content's available and facilitating their learning um, as opposed to delivering content um, like we're used to doing. Also, too, with our urban youth, it works best when we listen more and we talk less um, because the students will, once they trust you, um, so relationships, 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 they'll open up to you and, and really um, allow you into their personal lives and their personal world. Um, and we also have to make sure, too, that we understand that their perception, whether it's true or not, is the reality in what they live. So, so it's really absolutely critical um, that we get to know our students, as I said, and that we look at them as individual. And so whether we're talking about differentiation of instruction or whatever, um, you know, lots of choice in terms of how they want to learn and let the students be the drivers of that. So we also have to know that we come with 
most often now a lot of you know I've, I've had teachers who grew up in the neighborhood and and all of that but they also went off to college and so their life experiences changed very dramatically um, and so even though they were from the neighborhood there were still differences um, because the students saw that they had left um, sort of their home base and we have to overcome that very strong misalignment so Kind of, you know, in closing, I think the best way to sum it up is this, the truth of edu urban education reform, that it's not about programs or plans or even organizational schema. Lord knows, we've tried a million different things. You know, the Bill Gates Foundation came in and said, what they need are smaller learning communities. And so we tried that. Um, then what we need is this, and then what we need is that. And quite frankly, all of it has been either a complete and absolute failure or it has only had minimal, minimal um, results. Because at the end of the day, there are two things that matter. Two things, that's it. The students and understanding who they are, but most importantly, it's about having the right teacher in the right place with our students to motivate and push them forward. Okay? So, that hang on sorry get back here and see you guys so that's the end of the lecture for tonight so what questions or comments or concerns do you guys have well not hearing any i'm gonna assume that we're all good <laughs> So this is a really small class, um, you know, which is, is okay. I'm not used to that. I'm used to really big classes. I usually have like 150 students plus. Um, but since this is our new program, you guys are definitely our urban um, school pioneers. So I think it's exciting. So if you guys have questions or concerns, you know, you can always email me. You can call me. Um, we can do a Zoom meeting one-on-one, -on -one, whatever you guys need. But, um, you know, assuming there's no more questions, I'm going to go ahead and end the meeting for tonight. We won't be meeting next week because it's Thanksgiving and hopefully you work in a school parish or district that is out all of next week. So enjoy your time. Um, uh, so, you know, I will see you the week after that. So y'all have a wonderful holiday. Spend time with your family and do stuff you don't normally get to um, so that we can make it all the way through till Christmas in the schools. Thank you guys. I appreciate y'all. I love reading your stuff and, and dialoguing with you. Um, and I'll talk to you later.